the world of politics to the world of business. This is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Kaylee Lines, I'm Joe Matthew. Today marks two years since the overturning of Roe v. Wade. The Biden campaign seizing on the anniversary of the Dobbs decision to spotlight abortion rights and blast former President Trump. This as both men prepare for Thursday's presidential debate in Atlanta. We'll have more on what's at stake with political scientist Lara Brown coming up this hour. And Israel signals it will shift its focus from Hamas to Hezbollah, as Netanyahu gives contradicting remarks about the prospects of a ceasefire deal in Gaza. We'll have more with Aaron David Miller of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. So obviously much to discuss today, Joe, as we begin this week, really looking ahead to Thursday and the many issues that will be on the table at that first presidential debate. Yeah, of course, we, we know the rules are set. That's about all we know about the way this is going to go. We're going to find out here together. Of course, we'll have special coverage uh, for you here Thursday uh, for the presidential debate. But, Kaylee, you know, when you think about what our polling has borne out, the economy, number one, the border, and, of course, the issue of abortion, which we've been talking about a lot today. Yes, because today marks two years since the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, the landmark case that had protected the right to an abortion nationwide for nearly 50 years. President Biden laying the blame squarely at the feet of one man. Here's what Donald Trump says about your freedom. After 50 years of failure, with nobody coming even close, I was able to kill Roe v. Wade. Decades of progress shattered just because the last guy got four years in the White House. Joining us now with more is Bloomberg's Saleh Mosin. So, Saleh, interestingly, we haven't heard from Donald Trump on the Dobbs decision today, but certainly the Biden administration not missing this opportunity to spotlight abortion. Kaylee, Democrats really shouldn't miss this opportunity because what we're looking at is an election with two historically unpopular candidates. So if we carve out just the Democrats, they are trying to find a way to get voters to the polls, get Democrats to the polls. If they aren't excited enough about Biden to come out and vote for him and then go down ballot, they're starting down ballot. Mm -hmm. There's an abortion, reproductive rights. If they can get this initiative on the ballot, it will force people out on election day, come out and vote, and hey, by the way, check Biden at the top of the ticket. This has a mobilizing factor even in states, though, without a ballot initiative, right? We're, we've seen Kamala Harris take this on, and her portfolio is probably her most uh, important issue that she's leaning into. What does Joe Biden need to do Thursday night to hit that home? There's a couple of things he needs to do, but on this issue, I think he needs to demonstrate to the American public and the core group of Democrats that he is trying to get out of their homes and come vote yeah. that he can actually make a difference and how uh, reproductive rights really are on a knife's edge in the country. He certainly uh, can strike a contrast. Bloomberg's Saleh Mosin, we thank you for being with us at the table. Also in Washington, Israeli Defense Minister Yov Gallant visiting the State Department today to meet with Secretary Anthony. Blinken, this trip coming as Israeli uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says intense fighting with Hamas will soon be put on hold, scaled back, some forces redeployed to fight Hezbollah in the north of the country. For more on that, we bring in Bloomberg's Nick Wadhams. Uh, a lot to talk about here, Nick, as we learn as well that Benjamin Netanyahu is essentially stepping away at last from this proposed ceasefire. Are we about to seek uh, a, a second front, essentially, in this conflict? Well, that's what it looks like, and that's really what this administration is working furiously to prevent. I mean, this would be the nightmare scenario that we have all talked about yeah. basically since October 7th, uh, the widening of a regional war that would obviously pit Israel against Hezbollah, but the, the way that it would roil the region and set countries even more against Israel would just be staggering. I mean, this is something that President Biden is doing everything he can to head off. And there are just so many questions here. I mean, Prime Minister Netanyahu is saying, okay, we're going to focus less on Gaza and focus more on Hezbollah. Hamas is still in place in okay. Gaza. So a lot of questions about why he's doing this and what may come next. Well, and considering that Hamas is still in place in Gaza and that Israel maintains its objective yeah. is to completely eradicate Hamas, where are we on the ceasefire prospects that Joe was alluding to after President Biden outlined right. this deal, Netanyahu seemingly 
isn't all that into it. I think what you saw was a big gamble by President Biden coming out saying, listen, Israel supports this deal. Hamas does not. Let's get this thing done. The ceasefire is going nowhere right now. Israel still insists on Hamas's total destruction. Hamas says it's not going to agree to any sort of ceasefire that doesn't leave it in control of Gaza. The result is that this is just a Gordian knot that cannot be broken. And uh, I think you're seeing an administration that's looking across its Mideast policy and thinking, OK, attacks by the Houthis are still up in Yemen. This pier we built is not getting aid to Gaza. We're not seeing a ceasefire. They are in a moment right now where they're sort of saying, what has become of our Mideast policy post-October 7th and what do we do now? And a month from today, Benjamin Netanyahu is scheduled to be in Washington <laughs> addressing a joint yeah. session of Congress. If there is, in fact, a second front open, if there's a war with Hezbollah underway, does he still visit the White House? Does that speech happen still? Well, uh, it's a great question. I mean, you know, he will find a lot of support from Republicans. Democrats do not want him to give that speech. Um, I, and But the, the issue you're really seeing here is what this is going to mean for President Biden, because after October 7th, he went to Israel. He gave Netanyahu a literal hug uh, and a, a, certainly a metaphorical one as well, saying mm -hmm. his support to Israel would be unconditional. Yeah. Once they start pushing into Lebanon, Netanyahu comes to Congress and almost certainly will criticize the Biden administration uh, from Capitol Hill. Uh, there's a lot of talk in the administration now that President Biden is going to need to move in some way off of this unconditional support for, for Netanyahu, but he's not there yet. We'll see if he says anything about that on Thursday evening. Bloomberg's Nick Wadhams, thank you so much. Also breaking this afternoon, possible changes to the Federal Reserve's plan for big banks' capital requirements. Sources telling Bloomberg that the Fed's new plan could significantly lighten the load on Wall Street lenders. Joining us now is the reporter who broke that story, Bloomberg's Katanga Johnson. So, Katanga, obviously there has been a lot of pressure from Republicans on Capitol Hill, from the banks themselves, for these changes to happen. What exactly do we understand they look like? We know that the Federal Reserve has said that they plan to make broad material changes. What we understand now, though, is that there is a three-page document that's been circulated from the Fed staff to other agencies that have to vote on the plan, just considering different changes to various parts of the proposal. Chiefly, we understand that the market risk bucket, that's risk tied particularly to the bank's trading book, uh, is ripe for changes that's potentially going to address the overall hike for capital to as low as 5% when, when taken into account. It's not just market risk, though. Operational risk, credit risk as well uh, are ripe for changes under, under these, this review of changing the proposal. Mm -hmm. Now, that's distinct from an entirely new plan. Uh, this three-page document does not address a reproposal, but it does lay out ways to get the current proposal down to, a, as we understand it, a manageable credit, a manageable hike uh, on overall capital. No, 5% is a long way from 16%, <laughs> Katanga. Is the headline, banks win? <laughs> Wall Street's definitely likely to chair if these changes are all taken into account, but we understand that they're still being discussed among the three agencies. Just because this document's being circulated doesn't mean that all the agencies involved, including the OCC and the FDIC, <laughs> are on board. Uh, but a decrease from 16% across the board, and I think as high as 19% actually for the eight biggest banks, any decrease to a single digit number would be considered a win. Katanga, what's the timeline on, on all of this getting finalized? Interesting question. We, we understand that regulators are discussing what it might look like to get it done as soon as the end of the year, potentially before the election, we reported uh, just over a month ago that there were some who were pushing to get it done as soon as August. It's unclear now, particularly given this document that considers a number of substantial changes, uh, how soon they are to get, how soon they were likely to get it done. However, uh, we understand that the, the agencies really do want to get the balance right. And so much of the discussion is around the substance, not so much on timing, mm -hmm. uh, even, even mm -hmm. though there might be some who have to vote on it that are hoping for the end of the year. He just broke the story only about an hour ago. Bloomberg's Katanga Johnson. Thank you, Katanga, for bringing the story to us here at Balance of Power. Coming up, we look ahead to this week's presidential debate more closely and what each candidate needs to do to win, to win over undecided voters. Political scientist Lara Brown joins next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio.
for many of them, they're concerned not only about issues of women's rights and reproductive justice, but also the economy. When we asked in 2020 what the biggest concerns were, they said abolition, they said police, they said the killings of Black Americans, but now they're thinking about pocketbook issues. And if these two candidates, who are in the lead, in fact, um, can't speak to that very quickly, then they're going to see a lot of young people disinterested and disaffected. That was Jen Jackson, political science professor at Syracuse University, this past Friday talking with me about the key issues that matter to young minority voters. Professor Jackson emphasized that both candidates need to appeal to the issues that matter most to young people at this week's debate coming up on Thursday. Joining us now with Mara is Laurel Brown. She is political science and author, political scientist and author of Amateur Hour, Presidential Character and the Question of leadership. Lara, welcome to Balance of Power. Thank you so much for being with us. Of course, this debate is unique in many ways, in part because it is a rematch, a redoing of the debates we saw in 2020 yes. between Biden and Trump. But there are things that make it unique, including how early it is in the cycle. They aren't even actually the official nominees yet. So are any voters, let alone the young minority ones who may be feeling very unenthused about both of these candidates, really going to be paying attention? Well, I think the hard part is always in presidential debates, you have the people who are partisans who tune in. Usually those who are um, somewhat interested voters or who are marginally aligned with either party, uh, they ignore the debates because there's no one to root for. Um, it's really a kind of partisan exercise in which both sides turn out in the audience, their team, uh, to cheer on their uh, candidate. Can I challenge the notion that we started with here, that young people are going to be watching this at all on Thursday night? I'd love to think they're all here with us here at Bloomberg, and God knows we'll have the debate for everyone. But aren't they going to watch this clipped up on Twitter the next morning or TikTok in some montage or meme that ridicules whatever the candidates were doing? And if so, that's going to direct the strategy by these two candidates. Everyone's going to go for a viral moment. Well, I think that's right. Um, I do think that most Americans, it's not just young people, it's really most Americans, um, will watch the debate and hear about the debate. In fact, the political science literature is really clear on this, hmm. um, that what matters more than the debate itself is the conversation about the debate in terms of, of who is the winner or who is the loser. So it is often the post-debate analysis, and this is why the campaign spend so much time trying to spin reporters and um, you know, claim that their side uh, won the debate. Well, they spin after the fact, surely, but it does yes. seem this time around there's some spin happening before, each side trying to lower the bar for themselves. Of yes. course, with Biden, it's the question of whether he can just maintain energy for the whole 90 minutes. The Trump campaign now seemingly is really focusing on the moderators of this debate at CNN, the idea that they are going to have access to that button that will cut off the microphone. How does the pre-spin factor into how we should be looking at the actual debate on Thursday? Well, it actually determines significantly how people view the debate afterwards. And it's because it's all about expectations. The expectations that you have going into the debate inform how you analyze and judge the debate later. So if there is a sense that one of the candidates is going to do better than the other, um, and then in fact you find some confirmation bias during the debate, um, that becomes the main claim. And everyone says, well, of course, they won because they won. Mm -hmm. um, and it becomes very tautological. And this is why, in some ways, um, debates are not always the best format uh, <laughs> to really get at what these candidates are doing or how they'll serve the country as president. Donald Trump says in the speech the other night that, that Joe Biden's going to be on drugs, right? He wants to <laughs> have a drug test. He went on Truth Social today calling for that, says he's going to get a jab in a part of his anatomy that I can't talk about here. <laughs> is, is that raising or lowering expectations for the president? Well, I think it goes along with what uh, the Trump campaign's sort of mantra was in the weeks after the State of the Union address. They had yes. lowered um, the expectations about President Biden's ability to deliver. And they accused deliver. him of being on something. That's that right. Way. And they accused him of being on something. And so I think what you see is uh, former President Trump trying to kind of affirm and reassert mm -hmm. that the only way that Biden can do well is if he's on drugs. Now, I mean, 
if I were the Biden campaign, I would probably um, go right back and say, great, I'll show up for a drug test. I hope you will, too. <laughs> you know, and I would put that out there. Mm -hmm. um, if this is going to be sort of a question of who's not on drugs, um, I do think we'll, we'll have an interesting to conversation. I think we're talking about this right now. Yeah. <laughs> of course, all of that, though, is focused basically on performance, not actually the words That's that they're right. saying, but how they're saying them. But debates That's are right. supposed to be just as much about policy, if not more about policy than performance, theoretically, and you well, sound like no, you're about I, to I, disagree. Yes, I, look, I look at you sort of quizzically only because <laughs> um, really most voters don't focus on policy. It's the partisanship of the two candidates that really inform their policies, and most, can, most voters um, and most Americans know that. They know what kind of the policy shorthand is because they know which party each candidate comes from. So this is a much more kind of personal, stature, character kind of a moment where voters are looking at um, how well these individuals may perform in this leadership role that we call the presidency. We were talking earlier about the whole, uh, were you better, are you better off now than you were four years ago question, which right. would play into any presidential debate. It's kind of a weird one, though, this time. When Joe Biden thinks about the prices that you were paying four years ago and Donald Trump thinks about the pandemic that you were living in with people dying around you four years ago, do neither want to answer that? Well, I don't I think that there is a reality that most Americans, um, when they think about the pandemic, they think mostly about the vaccines mm. and they have kind of forgotten what life was like. Um, in the year that President Trump was in office before the vaccines were developed. Yeah. And that um, time was a very fearful time. Most Americans have kind of shunted that away. Um, hmm. But they also do remember uh, that the economy was in a good position before the pandemic hit. And then when the pandemic did come about, uh, the federal government engaged in massive spending to help make sure that most Americans didn't kind of fall through the floor um, when everything else stopped. And I think, you know, you have to understand that most Americans look at where we are now and they say, well, the costs are more. I'm not getting the financial assistance I was. Yeah. And even if my wages are higher, I deserved it. I earned that wage increase rather than that is sort of a collective phenomenon. So the economy questions in the debate are Trump's to lose, essentially, is what you're saying. Well, I think they are really um, both sides have a challenge in terms of convincing the American public that they will be better for the economy. But we know um, that in, in sort of every way possible, the economy is actually doing quite well at the moment. Um, if anything, there's a question about sort of the disinflationary pressures that are coming toward goods and services. And there's some questions about weakening in the GDP now. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll see if we're calling this debate amateur hour by the time we're done. <laughs> Lara Brown, we thank you for being with us at the table. It's great to have you back on Bloomberg. Coming up two years ago today, Roe v. Wade was overturned. We'll have a closer look at abortion access across the U.S. after the decisions were left up to the states. The data next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. I'm Joe Matthew alongside Kaylee Lines in Washington. Today marks two years since the Supreme Court overturned the landmark case known as Roe v. Wade that ended the constitutional right to an abortion. It's turned the issue over to the states and onto the campaign trail now for the White House. That's where Bloomberg's Tyler Kendall joins us now with a closer look at the data. Tyler? Yeah, hey, Joe. Since Roe v. Wade was overturned two years ago, it left decisions about abortion protections and restrictions up to the states. And in the time since, 14 states have enacted near total abortion bans or no longer have abortion care available. An additional three states have enacted six-week bans, also known as heartbeat bans, uh, commonly known as heartbeat bans, and also considered to be restrictive policy. Now, uh, 
Even as uh, more restrictions have been put into place, abortions are actually on the rise in the U.S. Data shows us that abortions last year crossed the one million mark the first time in over a decade. Uh, that's, of course, 2023 was the first full calendar, calendar year since Roe was overturned. But when we really dig into the data, an analysis from the Guttmacher Institute, which tracks abortion care, finds more people are now traveling farther for access. Nearly one in five people who need abortions last year had to cross state lines to do so. That's double the rate from 2020 before Roe was overturned. As you mentioned, it's taking center stage in the campaign and the race for the White House. I want you to listen here earlier to Vice President Kamala Harris. Harris on the campaign trail, uh, name checking her Republican challenger, former President Donald Trump, when it comes to the issue. Donald Trump thinks the government is in a better position to tell women what's in their best interest than women are to know for themselves. But Joe Biden and I trust women, and women trust all of us to fight for their most fundamental freedoms. Now, we've yet to hear from former President Trump today marking the two years, but earlier this year, he declined to endorse a national abortion ban, saying that this issue really should be left up to the states. Here were his latest comments from over the weekend talking about the issue. We did something that was amazing. The big problem was it was caught up in the federal government, but the people will decide, and that's the way it should be. The people are now deciding, and some states are a little bit more conservative, and some states are much more liberal. With the decisions now up to the states, a growing number of them are expected to see abortion-related ballot initiatives come November. Joe and Kaylee, so far four states have secured a constitutional amendment to appear on the ballot that would either enshrine or expand abortion access, including Florida, which currently has that six-week abortion ban on the books. All right, Bloomberg's Tyler Kendall at the White House tonight. Thank you so much. And of course, Joe, as we mark two years since the court decided to overturn Roe v. Wade, we also are awaiting potentially this week an opinion from the court on another abortion-related issue about That's access right. to it in emergency situations. So another abortion-related ruling could be coming. That's so, true. I'm curious to see uh, what role the issue plays in this debate on Thursday night. And yeah, whether definitely. Joe Biden says the word out loud. Or does he frame it as reproductive rights? Yeah, exactly. We'll all have to tune in Thursday to find out. But coming up here on this Monday edition of Balance of Power, a look at the escalation between Israel and Hezbollah and what it means for the war against Hamas. Aaron David Miller of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace joins us next on Bloomberg TV and Radio. Israel has now offered, Israel has offered, a comprehensive new proposal. It's a roadmap to an enduring ceasefire and the release of all hostages. This proposal has been transmitted by Qatar to Hamas. The first phase would last for six weeks. Here's what it would include. A full and complete ceasefire. A withdrawal of Israeli forces from all populated areas of Gaza. That was President Biden on May 31st, a Friday, announcing an Israel-approved ceasefire proposal at the time. That deal, though, is never approved by Hamas and has been repeatedly questioned in Israel. Over the weekend, added confusion after Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu gave an interview saying, quote, if there is an agreement, it will be on our terms, and that would not mean ending the war, withdrawing from Gaza and leaving Hamas rule intact, unquote. Then earlier today, a statement on the official X account of the prime minister saying in part, quote, our position has not changed, unquote. Joining us now to carry on this conversation once again, Aaron David Miller, senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Aaron, it's great to have you back. We've been trying to get a sense, as you know, for weeks about the status of this ceasefire proposal. But after what I just said, do you think there was ever a deal to begin with? I think it's really hard. And thanks for having me. You know, what, what matters in a negotiation ultimately is time and urgency. Deals close when both parties are in a hurry. And sadly for the administration, uh, the clocks of Hamas and the government of Israel are actually more in sync than the uh, Biden clock. I don't think the prime minister would accept uh, a comprehensive agreement, even though he signed on to it, unless somehow 
uh, he could ensure that Hamas would not remain as a vibrant or vital force in whatever post-conflict governing structure exists in Gaza. And Hamas is not going to trade their remaining hostages, even if they agreed to a phase one deal, limited exchange for six weeks to expire. They're not going to trade the remaining hostages for any short and cessation of hostilities and withdrawal of Israeli forces and security and safety for their senior leaders. So I think there would be a chance for a phase one, but not a comprehensive uh, plan, no. So it all comes down to the end game, essentially, what the day after is going to look like and the fundamental disagreement between Israel and Hamas on their different views of, of what that is. Is that something that, frankly, any of these mediators are going to be able to help them negotiate, whether it's Qatar, Egypt, or, or the U.S.? Or is this literally just the Netanyahu government and the leaders of Hamas? I think it's the two major combatants, Hamas, uh, responsible for the terror surge of October 7th, and the Netanyahu government, now minus uh, uh, Benny Gantz, um, mm -hmm. uh, for conducting the operations in an effort to destroy Hamas's military capacity and the resulting um, exponential rise of Palestinian deaths and the humanitarian catastrophe uh, in Gaza. So it's the, two, it's the two combatants. They've controlled the ebb and flow of this conflict from October 7, and they continue to control it now. And in a conflict where both sides see uh, the stakes as existential or near existential, the, the influence of outside parties, even one like the United States that has leverage over the Israelis, uh, is going to remain very limited. And, I, and I'm afraid that's where we are right now. Well, as you know, Aaron, there have been a lot of questions about whether a new front could open to the north uh, with Hezbollah. Earlier today, we spoke with retired General uh, Kenneth McKenzie, his former commander of U.S. Central Command, who told us this about Israel's ability to potentially fight a war on two fronts. Israel does have the capacity to fight a two-front war, but it would be a war fought at a much higher level of risk and there would be far greater damage to Israel if they if they enter this war. It's important to understand what hasn't happened so far is a massive LH, Lebanese Hezbollah, attack into Israel. There have been tit for tats across the border, but Hezbollah has not chosen to strike south with the very lethal, very highly capable weapons that they've received from Iran. So, Aaron, what's likely to happen first? A ceasefire with Hamas or a new war with Hezbollah? Well, they're, they're tied in together. Uh, it's really difficult to imagine. And maybe the ri maybe risk aversion will prevail. Maybe the government of Israel and Hezbollah uh, don't want to open the box of what General McKenzie is talking about. And what he's talking about is Hezbollah's 120,000 to 200,000 high trajectory weapons of various ranges of lethalities and precision that can cover most of Israel's infrastructure and most of its population centers. And on the Israeli side, a massive ground campaign. They use four divisions in Gaza. Lebanon is much bigger to destroy Hezbollah, push it back from the border and destroy, unfortunately, Lebanese infrastructure. A lot of Lebanese are going to lose their lives. And it may spark a regional war. I don't think, however, that the risk of such a, an occurrence can be discounted as long as the Israeli-Hamas conflict goes on. And that, that I think, is the... the sort of double bind that the administration uh, finds itself in. I'm still banking on the risk aversion that for the last 18 years, since summer of 06, has kept Hezbollah and Israel from launching the kind of military engagement that I just described. Because if they don't and they get into this, Middle East is going to see something it's never seen before. A major regional war, rising oil prices, plunging financial markets, and a degree of instability, which could involve poor Iraqi and Iranian militias striking U.S. targets, Israel and Hezbollah in a massive exchange. Iran will get into this. We will get into this. And I suspect uh, the longer it goes on, the greater the chances are that um, the, Gulf will, the Gulf will be an arena of competition. Uh, and nobody wants to see anything like what I described. I just don't see at this point how you can completely discount the risk uh, unless you can get a ceasefire in Gaza. It's a terrifying picture that you're painting, Aaron, but just so we understand you clearly, essentially you think if another front were to open between Israel and Hezbollah directly, that opens the regional conflict because it won't just be Israel and Hezbollah, it will be the United States and Iran that are directly 
drawn into combat. Hard to imagine they stay out of it, given the, the nature of the exchange. Remember, in the summer of 06, you had 5,000 Hezbollah with relatively low-tech weapons shutting down the northern half of Israel from Haifa to the Lebanese border for 33 days and 34 days. And they were launching rockets on the 34th day. Now you have a massive arsenal supplied by Iran, and you have not just unguided short and long-range missiles, you have precision-guided missiles, which can target Israeli population centers and critical infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Hezbollah doesn't have thousands of those. They have hundreds of them. But they can still do enormous damage on the Israeli, uh, on the Israeli home front. So again, the Middle East has never seen anything like what I'm describing. And that's why it needs yeah. to be avoided. Can it be? Is, I wish I had the answer to that. Is almost Hochstein enough to stop it from happening? Smart guy uh, with a lot of really good proposals in his pocket. Uh, and, and I think there is a deal uh, that would essentially de-escalate the situation. I just don't see how you get out of it without first quieting down the Israel-Hamas front. Because Hezbollah, I, I think Hezbollah does not want a major engagement with, Iran, with, with Israel right now. I think the Iranians, in the day, with the death of President Raisi and elections coming up, I don't think they want it. And, you know, the prime minister is due here July 24th to address the joint session of Congress. Frankly, I'm not sure he wants that right now either. Um, but again, uh, there's got to be enough will and space on the part of, of the combatants to let Amos Hochstein, very talented, very focused, mm. to do his work. All right, Aaron David Miller, Senior Fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Thank you so much, as always, for joining Thanks. us this evening. Thanks, we appreciate Aaron. your time. Now coming up, Democrats seizing the moment to highlight abortion rights as we mark the two-year anniversary of the Dobbs decision. We'll be joined with our political panel next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. It's changed how people think about abortion as from being something wicked, which is what the right has worked on for so long, to, you know, get us used to the idea that abortion is murder and nothing less. And now it's been transformed into, well, abortion also can facilitate having your own family. That was Carol Sanger, professor emerita of law at Columbia University Law School on Bloomberg Radio earlier today, discussing why pro-choice activists are having an easier time getting on the ballot than pro-life activists. This is, we mark, two years since the overturning of Roe v. Wade and the decisions on abortion rights being left to the states. Joining us now is our political panel, Rick Davis of Stoneport Capital and Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University and senior democracy fellow with the Center for the Study of the Presidency and Congress. Great to have you both here. Jeannie, obviously the Biden campaign we have seen today seizing on this opportunity to talk about abortion rights, to paint a contrast with Donald Trump. But it's Vice President Kamala Harris they've been rolling out today. Joe Biden is at Camp David preparing for the debate. Should he have not spoken to the American people today? You know, I think Kamala Harris has done such a good job taking on this issue, and she's really become the spokesperson for protecting our right to health care as women. And so I think having her out there is very important. I would have liked always to see the president out there, but he is deep in debate prep. And also, let's not forget, this is not the most comfortable issue for Joe Biden. And I think that's why Thursday is going to be so fascinating. Sometimes he talks about this issue without even mentioning the word abortion. He's an 80, you know, 80 year old, 81 year old man. And he is a, a, you know, a devout Catholic. So this is a tough issue for him. But I do think I would have preferred he come out. He did come out in video and those have been effective and they are making the case over and over that if Donald Trump is reelected, more rights will fall and our right to health care is something we need to protect from the GOP at this point. Nobody's questioning Joe Biden's position on abortion, though, right? Even if he doesn't say the word out loud, there's some misunderstanding, I think, some confusion at least 
about where exactly Donald Trump is on this issue. What does he need to say on Thursday night? Well, I think he's actually fomenting that confusion, right? He wants to have it kind of both ways. He wants credit for having overturned Roe yeah. uh, by putting people on the court that would do that. Uh, but at the same time, he doesn't want the burden uh, of somehow buying into, like, the national uh, abortion ban that mm -hmm. some of the members of his congressional party uh, want to push. And so he's just sort of, you know, being the old Donald Trump, right? You know, a little, a little hard to pin down and saying, oh, it's up to the people, you know, that's his everyday mantra now. It's mm -hmm. up to the people mm -hmm. in the states. So even if the states, like in Florida, as Jeannie mentioned, you know, put forth a very severe ban of only, you know, six weeks uh, to have an abortion, that um, he's not going to take any lumps for that. He's just going to actually probably say, well, the people have spoken. Hmm. Of course, we've heard a lot from Donald Trump over the weekend. While Joe Biden was holed up at Camp David, he was in Pennsylvania speaking at the Faith and Freedom Coalition, specifically talking about an idea that he floated to Dana White, this chief executive of the Ultimate Fighting Championship, UFC, about setting up a migrant league of fighters. I have an idea for you to make a lot of money. You're going to go and start a new migrant fight league. Migrants, only migrants. And then at the end of the year, the champion migrant is going to fight your champion. And I hate to tell you, Dana, I think the migrant might win. That's how tough they are. These are not, this is not a normal situation. And Rick, Dana White was asked about this, confirmed that Trump did indeed suggest that, though he mm. said he did it as a joke. Can you afford to be making jokes like that at this point in the election cycle, especially when you're about to be on a debate stage with Joe Biden on Thursday? Yeah, I think his last line was the appropriate one. This is not a normal situation. <laughs> uh, why would you go to a faith and family rally like that uh, on the eve of the anniversary of the overturning of Roe? And your only message that comes out of that whole event is some kind of messed up theory of having a migrant, you know, uh, boxing league. Uh, honestly, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a huge problem for him in that when you, when you watch him on that clip, he's looking straight into the camera, which means he's not reading off the teleprompter, which wow. means he's on his own. Yeah. And I think this is the thing that keeps the, the Trump campaign chiefs up at night, especially this week, is thinking when he looks up at that camera on Thursday night in that debate, you have no idea what's going to come out of that mouth. And he might just feel like this is another good idea to sell to the American public. Wow. Maybe he's got a little thing going with pay-per-view. Kind of <laughs> surprised this isn't getting more coverage in this case. Jeannie, I don't know if uh, Donald Trump's reelected, if he plans to rebuild the Coliseum or how all of this would come together here. Uh, but are we just in a world now where, where nothing matters if it comes out of Donald Trump's mouth? We seem to be, um, you know, the idea that there would be, you know, something akin to a fight club for migrants, and it gets worse than that. He's talking about exploiting people at a moment of horrific distress and then deporting them all for money because he talked about the fact that they would make money off of this. I mean, it's utterly deplorable. He said it twice over the weekend, once to Rick's point to a Christian group. And the laughter he is hearing as he often tests these messages is what he thinks is going to resonate with people broadly. But as Carl Rove said on Fox over the weekend, he has been losing support amongst independents, and that is a problem for him since the conviction. If he wants to win, he's got to win independence. A nine-point drop in that category is a problem for him. And I think these kinds of statements are part of the reason. So he is going to have to watch himself at an event like the debate, where he'll likely get many more eyeballs than he got in his rallies over the weekend. But what he's not going to get, Rick, is something Jeannie just mentioned. Reaction from an audience, whether it's laughter or applause or boos, all of that will be missing. There will be no audience present. Could that actually change the behavior of the former president? Because this will very much not be a rally. Yeah, I think it's going to offset his timing. Uh, he's a performance artist, so I don't doubt that he can do something in front of a camera. He, he didn't have an audience when he did The Apprentice. <laughs> and, uh, and so I think that, you know, you don't underestimate his ability to sort of function within the confines of a studio. Mm. He's more used to it than Joe Biden is. And so uh, I, think, I think that the real uh, question is, you know, how much will he go off script? Because that is something he's been doing a lot lately. 
It's been vexing his campaign because they can't seem to get a decent message week going. Uh, and I think this is going to really tell the American people whether or not they're entered into potentially a Trump administration that's off the rails or whether there's this new, improved, more sober hmm. President Trump that they can anticipate seeing. And I think this is a key night, Thursday night, for Donald Trump to show one or the other. And that's why we'll have special coverage here on Bloomberg TV and radio. Hope you'll join us starting at 8 p.m. Washington time. We'll have the debate itself and the analysis that you would expect. Coming up with our panel, we'll turn to some of the races to watch on another primary day tomorrow. More with Rick and Jeannie next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. In this district, that youth vote is not as strong as in other parts of the country, uh, even in other parts of New York City. So this is not going to be, we're not expecting an overwhelming youth turnout. If he's able to get one, we'll see if he can narrow that lead, particularly in the Bronx. But um, there's also going to be a very strong uh, older vote, uh, and that's what we normally see in these primaries. Spencer Kimball, Emerson College Polling Center Executive Director, talking with us earlier today on Bloomberg Radio on how voters over 40 seem to favor Westchester County Executive George Latimer, while voters under 40 turn to New York Representative Jamal Bowman. Back with us now, our political panel, Rick Davis of Stone Court Capital and Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University, senior democracy fellow at the Center for the Study of the Presidency and Congress. Jeannie, you're in New York right now. This is what we're looking at on a primary day tomorrow, Emerson College, Spencer Kimball has uh, the congressman down by 17 points in his most recent survey. Are there enough young people to make up the difference? I think it's going to be very tough. I know this district well. I live in it. I know both of these candidates. Um, you know, one thing that, you know, a lot of focus, obviously, in this district on what is going on in the Middle East. But beyond that, I could tell you that George Latimer has been a fixture in the district in a variety of capacities as an elected official for many, many years. And so he is a well-known entity. Even though Jamal Bowman is the incumbent in this case, it's one of the rare times in which I think the challenger is better known, actually, than the incumbent in some mm. ways. And so we may see this as really the first race of this cycle in which an incumbent loses. I think that is probably likely. You know, Spencer mentioned this with the Emerson poll. We haven't gotten a lot of polls, but primary turnout in New York is notoriously pitifully yeah. low. And so I don't think we're going to get huge turnout. There's been an early vote. And I think Latimer is really favored on this one, unless the rally over the weekend, which had craziness of its own, mm -hmm. was able to get out some of the more younger voters. But I am not inclined to think it goes in that direction. Well, Rick, as Jeannie points out, this is a safely Democratic district, a Democratic primary. Is this going to be a tell on what will happen in November for Democrats as a whole as they try to navigate the Israel question? Yeah, look, I think this is a pretty good tell. Uh, I like that term because um, I, I think this is a classic contrast between two people who have diametrically opposed views on Israel. Mm -hmm. And um, Latimer has been a consistent supporter of Israel. And Bowman, as a member of the squad, has been a consistent uh, critic of it. And so I think this is a clear line that voters are going to choose from. And as you can see uh, in the polling, uh, it's not even close. And if you have to look at what the best possible turnout is, for a you know election like this where it's going to be a low turnout you want those over 40 over 50 voters because they turn out in much higher rates than any you know buddy from 18 to 30 so uh, i think this is a lock and it's a lock for good reasons well we'll be talking about this a lot more tomorrow and wednesday of course tomorrow primary day and our thanks to our great panel rick davis and Jeannie Shanzano, thanks for the insights to both of you, as always. Check out the Washington Edition newsletter for more on all the stories we've been talking about this hour. Find it on the terminal and online. Thanks for joining us on Balance of Power. We'll see you right back here tomorrow on Bloomberg TV and radio.